fish. Along with a number of other municipalities that normally host the grazing school for women. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we weren't able to host our annual um, two day event. And so we decided that a, a grazing school webinar series would be the best way to go about it this year. So we actually have four webinars planned for the month of June. The first one, of course, being tonight on tree and um, pest basics. The next one coming up will be on the 16th and the 23rd, both uh, talking about dugouts, but in a little different way. So those should be very interesting as well. And the last one, we're gonna be talking about, so, about some grazing management topics. Um, and then we'll be going, um, having those that series conclude. Um, one of the things I'd like to mention is that uh, because this is a webinar, uh, you will be able to only ask questions in the Q&A box. So if you wanna find that, then the moderators will see those questions and we can pose them to the, the presenter um, throughout the presentation. Also at the end of the presentation, we will be doing um, a draw for those who attend and the draw is for a PV Mart gift card and we will get the address of the winner and send that out to you in the mail so that's a that's a little bonus for attending tonight. Um, we also have a couple of polls that we're going to be doing through the webinar. So if we could get the first poll launched, and it's just to help us understand the participants that are here um, this evening. So if you could go ahead and fill in the poll, we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. This just helps us when we are doing our grant reporting at the end of the year. It's helpful to know what kind of producers are attending the events um, and what things that are of interest um, to you as uh, participants. And it also helps us um, plan for future events. So like I said, this is an annual event. And basically we are um, striving to meet needs of the producers within the areas that we serve, which is this Northeast region. And so one of the things that uh, we look forward to every year is the two day school, but because of COVID, we're not able to do that. So um, we're hopefully trying to come up with some other ways to engage and maybe by the fall, we can do a field day or in-person event as well, but we'll have to wait and see how the summer goes, I guess. So it looks like everybody's figuring out how to use the poll. So that's great. Basically, you just go in and click on the answers to the questions. So we have a few more people joining us. So right now we're just doing a quick poll to see who the people are that are attending this event. Um, so if people wanna click on, on that and we'll go from there. That's great. Thank you everyone for participating in the poll. So I think um, because we are aware that your time in the evening is precious and we want to make sure that we are um, sticking to our time frames for this event, um, I'm just going to introduce our speaker and then he's going to take the floor to present um, all this wealth of knowledge. Um, I have known Toso for quite some time and I do know that trees are his specialty. So we are very lucky to have him um, tonight and to be able to present to us about um, this topic which we've um, heard is something of interest to people and uh, that people are looking for more information on tree pests and tree management and how to take care of um, 
their trees on their property, which is an important aspect of a lot of landscapes. So Toso is a founder of ATTS Group Inc. and Yard Whispers Consultancy. Um, this business was 26 years experience in every aspect of the trees and forestry um, realm. Toso graduated from the University of Belgrade in Yugoslavia and holds a degree in forest engineering. He's a member of the professional agrologists and obtained an ISA certified arborist and ISA tree risk assessment qualification. He has extensive communication experience through 2700 public speaking events. He was just saying this is like his 50 plus webinar that he's been on. So he's definitely had a, had a chance to practice this one. Uh, he's done multiple TV and radio interviews, and he's the author of over articles, guides, fact sheets, and technical materials. So Toso, we're glad that you could join us, and I'll uh, let you take over the floor. Thank you, Amy. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me, and, and it's my privilege actually to speak to this event. As I mentioned before, uh, folks, I think I was, uh, uh, when you had a first uh, event. I was uh, speaking on that event as well. So uh, keep doing great work and it's very important to work. And again, it's my privilege to be here tonight. I truly wish I can be with you face to face. It's uh, webinars are okay, but it's not the same. But I guess hopefully very soon we'll be able to see each other and uh, give a hugs and, and smiles and face to face. It's really, I, I miss that greatly. Um, uh, this is a little bit of my company. I've been doing, um, I've been working with the government of Alberta, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry since uh, uh, till last year, March, and then uh, they let me go. And since then I've been doing uh, on my own. Um, so far, so good. I can't complain about that. I do provide a range of the consulting services to the, to the various clients from golf course industry, parks, municipal government, um, educational institution and NGO. So it's it's been, um, it's been good, you know, considering the situation. I put this as my logo with a uh, with, uh, child and a uh, grown-up adult in the tree. And I always said uh, uh, anything related to the trees is the generational thing. So I can guarantee if I would ask you when you planted your first tree, you will still remember uh, regardless of your age. So um, planting the trees and taking care of the trees, it's, it's, uh, it's a legacy. Uh, a long-term legacy for every of us. Um, as I mentioned, I provide a whole range of the services um, to the uh, various uh, groups and organizations. Um, again, from agroforestry services, to so talk about shelter belts and windbreaks to the pruning. I do not do actually pruning uh, as many other pruning and you know, tree removal company. I'm much more for consultants. Uh, where I provide on the pest management or the hazards and the appraisals and that stuff. I, I do only pruning on my own or for the uh, clients who do have orchards. I grew up in former Yugoslavia when we have a orchards, two orchards. Uh, I think both of them are like a 70 years old. And my grandfather and my father were teaching me how to prune the old range of the fruit trees. So I really do only from pruning, I only do that uh, when people call me. So go right away into it. Um, if you do have a trees on your farm or on your property, whatever acre it is, whatever you have, um, there is a multiple, multiple life functions of those trees. And I, this is a, just some of them. There's a probably many, many more. And I always said to the people, you can pick and choose any of them. What is important to you? Tree do provide all of those values that I just listed uh, here. And, uh, and again, some people have a certain preference to it. Um, what I'm finding out, uh, again, throughout, throughout my career, that uh, uh, people also have an emotional tie to the trees. Uh, as I mentioned, that lots of people remember when they planted the first shelter belts or windbreaks, who was there, how did they plant it. Um, when it comes to the livestock, there is a lots of values the trees do provide. For, uh, number one is actually protect the livestock from the cold. Uh, or, or hot uh, uh, weather conditions in many ways. Um, and it does reduce the, some of the noise or, or, or dust if you have a feedlot operation um, in this case. So uh, again, there's a plenty of functions and you can pick and choose. And actually, for most of the time, it, you actually all of them apply to your farm. This is my ideal farm, as I, as I always called. Um, it is a good friend of mine. 
uh, just southwest of uh, Red Deer, um, actually west of Penhold, toward to the Red Deer River. Um, he works with Alberta Parks and uh, he planted this 11 acre property when uh, 13 years ago, there was nothing there, nothing on this property. And why I cannot choose this one for the acres, and there's a reason for that. Uh, he, Terry planted over 52 different tree and, and shrub species on, on this property. And if you look at his neighboring property, when they have a typical one row of the trees or in this, on the bottom, you have a two rows of the trees, spruce and some shrubs. Uh, you can see in the terry, you have a diff different tree species, uh, different heights, different shape, different sizes. Um, and the, the beauty of that is diversity. And if you, anything remember uh, tonight from me is please remember the more diverse you have your property come to the trees and shrubs, the healthier your property is going to be, the healthier your farm is going to be, the healthier actually your livestock, if you're in livestock operation or your land. Because each of those trees, not just their trees and shrubs, they also have a bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, and insects, and all of them combined to the whole ecosystem and performing so many functions um, that we take for granted. And the other thing also um, that in this particular case on the left corner uh, or on the bottom, if you get some disease or very cold weather or something happened, you literally can lose all of those trees within, a, within a one year. In his case, if, you, if something come up, in, let's say mountain pine beetle comes, it's gonna take only pine, but all the rest of the trees is gonna stay there. Um, and that's the beauty, the more diverse you have, the more stable your trees and shrubs and property will be. So again, if anything you remember, please just remember plant as many as you can and diversity, diversity and diversity. That's I always, I always said to everybody. Here's what he planted. And uh, again, he's just uh, west of Pentacle. Um, and he's, plant, he's gonna plant more. And again, some of the species that you might think shouldn't be here, uh, they're there and they're doing very well. He, he told me every single of them is just uh, going like crazy and it's healthy. Um, and they have a different different uh, heights, different ages uh, in some aspect, but also different colors and flowering and and, and all beauty. So um, be very creative. Don't try to limit um, trees and shrubs of your property. You know, three to four species. You know, you can see here pretty much. I wouldn't say this can, can do in all across Alberta because Southeast Cornwall, Alberta or some other north, uh, northern parts of Alberta may not have some of those trees to grow because it it's, could be harsh conditions. But many of them, even when I go to Southern Alberta, Brook, uh, Brooks, Medicine Hat, um, all the way to Pincher Creek, the amount of trees and shrubs that people plant over there, it's huge. And what is growing there, it's always amazing. So don't try to limit and say, oh, well, I can't, this can go grow in my place. It can. It, lots of things that shouldn't be here, it's growing very well here in Alberta. So again, diversity. When it comes to the shelter belts, uh, you folks are probably familiar with them. There is a field and farmyard for around the livestock, wildlife planting or the buffer. Each of them are almost identical purpose is protection. It is protect your livestock or your home or your field or for the wildlife or for the water. Each of them has a purpose of the, of the protection and provide a certain functions uh, to, the, to the land. Uh, which one you can choose, it's up to you. You can use all of them if you, if you prefer that way. But again, that's the main, uh, main purpose is to have, is to have a trees uh, on, your, on your property um, to perform certain functions. This is my second um, most beautiful uh, photos of the farm. And you can see here, folks, uh, you have a field, typical agricultural operation. You have a two windbreaks. You have a riparian area. You have a, a farm up there. You have a water bodies. It's really, I, I call this ideal farm anywhere around the world. Um, and again, uh, if you have a something like this, that would be awesome. Not many of the people, not many people um, uh, see this as a, as a perfect farm, but it's definitely can do the agriculture. Uh, and still uh, have a wildlife and, and water, protect the water bodies and enjoy the beauty of the land. 
so again this beside the terry this is my uh probably the uh, best barn i i've seen it and it's beautiful um water in the trees you have a folks of cows and fish they've been doing and promoting all of the all the greater uh, importance of the riparian area and uh, protection of the water um what i learned you know for 20 something years here in alberta lots of farmers told me this the moment you remove the trees from the land it's the moment that water starts dropping down Today, I was in the early in the morning, I went to uh, you know, between the border of the Sturgeon County, Lax and Pan, and it was a lake. And the landowner showed me the lake uh, just 15 years ago. The water was uh, uh, at one point that he said, that's where I launched my boat. And it, within a 15 years, that lake dropped uh, probably 70 feet further away where it used to be and the water down dropped. There is a several factors and reason why that happened, but one of the for sure, I don't need to look is, you know, in the past, the amount of forest that used to be and how much forest disappeared. Uh, again, the moment you clear the forest, the less snow it's gonna be there, the less moisture, local moisture. Lots of people don't realize that one balsam poplar, poplar tree, like a mature big balsam poplar tree, 70, 80 feet, can take between 500 and 700 gallons of water a day. One single tree can, through that tree, can go almost 2,000 liters of, wa of water a day. And that's also create a local micro microclimate. And that's why we have a local, some of the rain and local weather condition because of the, of the, of the tree. So it, water in trees really goes hand to hand. Again, I took several photos uh, for my dear friends in the United States, uh, because unfortunately in 2013, uh, Harper government shut down Agroforest Center in India had. Uh, right now, folks, we have uh, absolutely no research when it comes to the agroforestry, shelter belts, windbreaks, tree planting, urban forestry, nothing, zilch. Uh, all of my uh, knowledge that I keep up is actually coming from the United States. Almost every Wednesday, I'm on webinar with Americans and showing me what they're doing, come to the shelter belts and windbreaks or urban forestry. Um, we here in Canada, we simply have nothing. No only, only organized research that we can know of. Uh, and again, what used to be the had for 100 years providing the research uh, on, on the trees and shelter belts and importance of that, that was shut down in 2013. Uh, provincial was shut down in 1994. So right now, if you ask anybody come to the new, any newest research on, on, on these topics, nobody does anything, period. So all of my things, I keep the good relationship with Americans and they provide lots of information about this stuff, what, what's going on. Um, this is a live example in North Dakota. They looked and put a, like a little windbreak and the wind was blowing and this is how much snow and how far, and then again, this is, um, scientifically they have a whole paper on that um and the people who pay for this actually uh that was north dakota transportation and all of the highways because there's lots of accident and lots of snow drifts and it costs people lives and also transportation and uh plus protection of the land but again the beauty of this they do they actually have a one study they use the wind tunnels that's used for the airplanes they put some of this stuff and do, using the wind, wind tunnels to do the research, what's going on with the, with the snow and, uh, and the shelter belts and everything. It's, it's, it's fascinating. So what they find out, if you folks have uh, any trees that is up to 15 or 20 feet tall, that will keep almost 80 tons of snow per, uh, per that amount. So it's a mind boggling how much snow uh, that the trees or, or, or actually fence uh, can t uh, store. And it's, it's very important for that, again, in certain parts of Alberta where the moisture is deficiency, but again, also protection from the, our highways, um, uh, because again, if you this snow end up on, on the roads, it's cost human lives, but also cost uh, us as a transportation. So it's, it's, again, there is a, I got a whole presentation on this coming from the United States they shared with me, um, they gave me, and again, I, if you ever want, I can share you all of that. Also, this was done, we I mean, know, good old PFRA of the, around the feedlots. 
um, and again, how to design the shelter belts, what's the distances and why is important. Uh, again, I was a part of the study on the, on the yields, on the crops, and Americans used the, all of the latest technology to figure out what is the, um, uh, uh, each crop uh, respond to the, having the shelter belts or not. And they used the, uh, all of the top keys live in the combine and measuring everything else. And in, in nutshell, from that research, I think it was done in 2019, they find out that that's approximately between five and 40%, depending on the crop, there's an increase in the yield. So the still the having the trees and the wind breaks uh, increase the yield. They also find out with the, uh, with the livestock operation, uh, how much less uh, uh, food they need to provide to the livestock because keeping them warm or cooling them off um, in, the, in, the, in the summertime. Now, uh, many of you probably have a trees uh, on your property. Uh, if you start from scratch, this is a long list of 11 things that I'm going to talk tonight. Um, and again, either, each of them, are, uh, don't try to skip it. If you're going to do any tree planting, a uh, new tree planting or, or rejuvenate old shelter belts in that sense. And I'm going to go uh, to some of them. First thing I always said to uh, people uh, is look the environmental condition. Look what is what you have on your land. What kind of soil? Because if, if you have a sandy soil, it's determined what kind of tree is going to grow there. If you have a heavy clay, it's going to find out what, what can grow there. Sun, where is the sun? It's the, some of the species like pine, uh, they, they must have a full sunlight. Spruce doesn't. But where the sun uh, uh, is going, uh, you know, exposure to the sun and the light is important. Wind, of course, if you build a, a, to protect your yourself is where the, where the most wind uh, coming from. Um, topographic features, hills, creeks, um, lakes, sloughs, whatever you have, all of the topography, because you're going to figure out where the water is running, where the wind is blowing, where the more sunlight, where is drier, where is wet, all of that. Is going to help with the topographic features. You can say, okay, I, I have to pay attention to this. Again, drainage is also very important. Um, you have to also look what the quality and quantity. Lots of people, you know, plant the trees, they will need the water at one point. Uh, what kind of water do you have? Um, I said to people lots of, you need to water trees, but first thing before you go to water trees, check out your. Uh, uh, salinity, in the, uh, sodium in your water. Lots of people don't check and they water the trees and literally killing the trees in the long run because of the high percentage of the sodium. Last not least is visit already uh, established shelter belts of property. Drive around, look around, talk to those people in, in, uh, if you're driving along the highway, stop by and say, hey, how did you do this? What grows here? What doesn't? Um, how can I change? How can you can you learn from there? So having the local condition is probably knowing and, and, and understanding and, and uh, understand the local condition is probably the most important thing when you want to plant the trees. Because again, I, last night I was, uh, I was in the Evansburg Wildwood area. I didn't know some of the local conditions and they told me, Tosha, this is all, probably the worst place uh, where it comes to the clay. And Hold, behold, when I was digging the hole for tree, it was after probably two inch of topsoil, it was a foot almost of the heavy clay. And I said, okay, this, uh, the good thing they planted, the, uh, they, they choose the elm trees because they have a very extensive root system and can handle the clay. If they choose something else, that tree would be dead from the beginning. So understand the local condition really is crucial what what can you or you can do it in your area a map it doesn't need to be anything uh, anything fancy um, the best thing you can do is i i think i pulled this google map from the uh just west of duke and on the highway 39 and you have this google map you can zoom it you have an area of photos that is for free you can measure the distance. You can see the way the water flow. You can see where the buildings are. You can see all of that. So you can draw on this. If you can't uh, call your kids or grandkids who might be more uh, technologically savvy than you or myself, and they will do that. They will measure the distance. They will look at what is there. They will be curious on, on, the, on this uh, topographic features and, and they can help you out. So 
have this some kind of map uh, to know where you're going to plant and what you're going to do and where there might be future expansion of your operation or not. And again, you can see it here is some of the uh, on the drainage with the low spot on the on, on the where, where the all of the existing roads are. Uh, you're not gonna like in this particular case. I think they planted the spruce and it's a highway 39, uh, very busy highway, lots of salt, and they planted the spruce. Um, right away, probably create a problem for themselves. Uh, number one, they plant the spruce on the south side. And number two, which is most important, spruce doesn't handle the salt at all. And majority of the trees, spruce trees in Alberta that I've seen along the highway are dead or half dead because of the salt. Salt is incredible killer of the, of the spruce trees. So again, be conscious there is a highway. There is a, lots of people don't know that on one mile of highway, in this particular case, 39, they use the seven tons of salt. It's a huge amount of sodium that is used just on one mile that end up in ditches and end up in our water for this. So again, use the aerial photography or, or Google Earth or whatever it is to really observe and look at uh, before you do decide to do any plan. And again, uh, personally, I'm sick and tired of seeing the beautiful shelter belts in Alberta um, and they were planted under a power line and people come and cut and constantly, constantly giving the stress to the other trees. Again, sideways, pathways, uh, pipelines, anything that you have, you, again, you can go over the Google Earth, draw the line, know where they are. You can plant uh, shrubs or small trees under the power line, no problem. But you cannot plant the big trees under the power line. So be, be conscious of that physical structure that you have. Now, once you look into that, uh, how to select the tree and shrub? What is, what's the uh, system in the place you might look and considering? There's lots of things that you, again, you look first what grows in, in the surrounding area. Okay, and talk to your neighbor, talk to the people around in your county or ask the people, hey, yeah, we, we can grow this, uh, this type of trees and shrubs in our county. The second thing is right tree, right tree in the right place. Uh, as I said last night, if people didn't buy the elm trees and let's say they bought the spruce or they bought uh, pine, that tree would never take off. It was incredible heavy clay. And the only thing can grow is black poplar, willow, elm, and aspen. That's it. And again, if they didn't put, you know, a proper their mind, you know, they would, they would uh, set for the failure. So, Keep this in mind, I'm gonna use this right tree and the right place is very important. Um, again, here's a good example of the uh, good tree at the wrong spot. On, on the key on the left side, you have again power line, and it's a constant cutting, constant uh, 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 topping of the trees and, and an issue with the power lines close to the homes. This one is always puzzles me uh, in a cities and urban areas that people plant this Swedish shaspen right next to the building. It's the, the moment they planted it's that tree is dead and it's gonna have a nothing but their problems. And why on, on the earth you would put the tree right next to the building like this? And the heat in the summertime is absolutely atrocious to this tree. And this tree might last instead of 30 years, might last 10, 15, done. And again, there is lots of things that you again roads. If you have a roads, don't plant some of the tree species because have extensive root system. So pay attention to some of those details. And again, good tree on the, at the wrong spot. Now, what did I choose? I call the key factors that are uh, how to choose the trees and shrubs. Again, start with the soil. Always start with the soil. Is it clay versus sand versus saline versus good soil? If you have a good soil, you can plant anything. If you have a saline uh, soil or salt in, in sodium in your soil, you're limited to the few spaces. If you have a heavy clay, depending how much heavy clay you have. If you have a sand, how much sand you have. So always start with the soil. Soil will determine what is the best tree and shrub can grow there and what is the potential capacity. If you have a rich soil, like again, around the Leduc uh, or, or Edmonton, many other places in Alberta, you can pretty much plant anything. Moisture, what are the moisture requirements? If you are in Southern Alberta, you have a limitation. 
if you sell some other place west in Drayton Valley, you have a lots of water or uh, even uh, up north in the Peace River. So again, I always choose between the willow and caragana. Willow loves water, caragana shouldn't be planted anywhere except the Oyen in that area. So don't plant caragana anywhere else, please. But the caragana is the, is the, for the dry step desert. They will grow in desert pretty much. Now come to the form and maturity. Do you want a round, columnar, you know, shapes? Which one works? Which one you prefer? Um, sun versus shade. As I mentioned, you know, pine, tamarack, and most of our other species love to grow under the full sunlight. Spruce and fir, they like to grow under the shade. So why, you know, don't try to expose them right away uh, to the full sunlight. Uh, growth. Some trees grow fast, but they die fast. And they die in our lives very early. So good example is that Swedish uh, poplar. They grow fast. Within a 30 years, that tree is dead. So depending what, 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 what do you prefer. Flowers. You, some of them, I, you might say, I don't want any flowers. Some of them, you might choose, do you want a purple flowers? Do you want a red? Do you want a whatever? So again, that's the choice one of the, uh, that you have. Fruits. Do you want it for your own consumption or you want it for the wildlife? Maintenance, which one? Do you want to plant and don't worry about it? Or do you want to always take care of your trees and kind of babysit them? Wildlife, again, some of you might not like the wildlife at all, um, but some of you like everything on, on your property. So from bees to birds to animals. So, and you can pick and choose. And the last and not least, uh, native versus introduced. If you do plant around the riparian area, um, go with native. Please do that. You know, again, cows and fish is extremely promoting this and, and, and it sh always should go with the native species. Around your yard and the home, you can uh, uh, plant much more exotic species or, or non-native introduced species. But these are factors that you have to look, at least think about it. And I said, okay, I want this, this kind of soil and kind of putting the check marks. Now, here is what it is I, 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 I used all the time, every day. It's called uh, NET plant search, that every tree nursery in Alberta has it. Not every, okay, sorry, probably 90%. And it's a wonderful software, as you can see here, that you can pick by the, I wanna follow, I have other day, lady said, I wanna leave purple. I said, okay, well, you have a, Schubert choke cherries, and then you have a crimson uh, uh, king uh, maple. And it's a purple, like a dark purple leaves. Uh, you want a growth rate. Uh, you want applications where it is. You want a deer resistant, okay. Uh, what kind of form you want? You want a wildlife attraction. Then you go into the flowers. You know, uh, flower color, foliage color, fall color, edible, fragrant, whatever you want. Then you have a sun, uh, site conditions, moisture. So it's free software. Um, I pick here uh, uh, Eagle Lake Tree Nursery. Uh, you can go, it's called Plant Search. And again, I know Milk Creek, uh, Eagle Lake, many of the nursery have this software. They pay for it. Uh, the fellow in Manitoba developed. And you can pick and choose. You want a height, you want a spread, you want a hardiness, and you click. Once you choose that, click on the button on the search. It's gonna, uh, you might say, I wanna see all of the birch bird trees and I picked that one. I said, okay, I have a paper, paper birch. Well, uh, it's a tree, how much is height, how much is spread, partially the sunlight. Uh, then I have a clump paper birch. And you can click on this again and it's gonna give you more information about those trees. It, this software is a wonderful, wonderful tool. It's really gives you a first cut. And then you might go back and say, I wanna see what my neighbor is doing. Did they plant some of that? How did it work? It doesn't work. Um, really test it. Read a little bit about it. And you can always ask people who knows more about this, but it's a wonderful first cut uh, what you can grow and choose for your property. It's really good tool. I use it all the time. And, and again, then I talk to the landowners. Okay, this is what this software come up. Let's discuss what exactly can fit to your property. And it gives it give that first cut. So again, keep, you can use, use this software, it's free. It's really free. Now, if you do have an issue with the salt, 
either on the, in the soil or along the highways. Um, I kind of build a, a, a list of the salt tolerant species that you can use. Kargana and Russian olive is extremely invasive. Do not ever, ever plant them, any of them, any, any of them close to the riparian area, same as the sea buckthorn, civil buffalo berry. Many of those should not, don't even come close to the riparian area uh, because they are very invasive. So make sure that you don't come close uh, to the, our native vegetation in that sense. But definitely can, you can plant around your homes if you have along the highways and you know you have a saline soil. So uh, you, you would be able to plant some of those species. Uh, and most of them, they can ha handle a certain amount of salt. And uh, if you have along the highway, definitely put a lilac, then the, maybe put a ash tree, then as a third row, you might put the spruce because the li lilac and ash will protect the spruce from, from the salt in that sense. So a podrosa pine also can handle, can handle the salt. So as I said, those species is at your uh, disposal, if you, especially along the highways, and if you know that you might have a problem with the, with the salt and the saline salt, uh, soil. Again, do not try to plant any of those invasive species around, around the water, uh, around the riparian area, natural, natural forest. Now, what I'm going to go through this, um, uh, some of those, a major group of the three species that I choose, uh, pines. Uh, you have a, this is what I have a six of them. I can probably add four more. So you have a Scots pine, wonderful plant in the shelter belts and windbreaks. Ponderosa pine is growing like really all over the Alberta. Um, mugo is usually people go around the home, and, but they, they have a different type of mugo, like a six or seven, at least different type of mugos. And then you have an etiological pine. Uh, then you have a jack pine, again, which is not here on the list. You have a bristle cone. Each of them, depend, I don't know where folks you are, but I can guarantee you that probably 70 or 80% of these pine species can grow on your property easily. And, uh, and they, they have, I can, I, I wanna, before I you know, go further, I wanna tell you there is no perfect tree. Every tree has a, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is no such a thing as a perfect tree. So, they might be good in some aspects, but not be as good in, in uh, other. So don't try to aim for the perfect tree. I always said, if you want a perfect tree, the best thing, buy the plastic one. You have to take a dust off, but you might have a perfect tree in that case. So um, come to the sports pine. I'll come to the pines. Generally speaking, they live long. They, they have a top root system uh, and they like the dry soil. Generally speaking, they don't, they don't like too much water in that channel. And they are incredible uh, come to the wind. They can withstand wind no problem at all. Then you go through the spruce. And again, you have a Serbian, white spruce, black, uh, Norway spruce, black spruce, uh, Colorado, uh, 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 blue spruce, fire. I mean, name it. There is a probably in that list, if you go to that search, you're going to probably end up with 25 different spruce trees and all different shapes and size and, and colors in many ways and forms. Uh, generally speaking, all of them may have a very shallow root system, excellent for the windbreak. They definitely grow slower compared to other tree species. And, uh, and again, uh, they definitely like to grow in, into the much more shaded area at the, when they're young. When they get mature, they can grow uh, in the full sun, like no problem. Uh, but again, they also cover a range of the soil as well. So some of them can go on very top on the very tough soil. So, but again, they are wonderful, wonderful windbreaks, wonderful for protection. Um, and uh, I mean, it gives also beautiful color in, in the winter time. Tamarack is a really large. Uh, Tamarack is native. Um, and that's, uh, both of them are only coniferous species that shed the needles in the fall and get, get this yellow color, golden color, and needles fell off and they grow right now, come back. There is a subalpine larch that is uh, in, the, in the mountain region that you can also uh, grow uh, in certain area in Alberta as well. Again, they are relatively sparse growing species and uh, they require full sunlight. Um, they don't handle lot, lots of uh, shade. Fir, this is probably most underutilized tree species in your shelter belts on your, in the yard in Alberta. 
People always think, oh, no way I can go Douglas fir. When I used to work in, here in Edmonton at CDC North, we have a, like a huge shelter belt of Douglas fir. I've seen Douglas fir in St. Paul, Bonneville. Uh, actually, I've seen in Vermilion uh, Douglas fir. In the South, I, I've seen Douglas fir. Uh, it's incredible tree species. Um, even subalpine fern, what I have here, it's in Edmonton. It's a beautiful tree and it's growing in, on, on the mountain region in Kananaskis and Jasper, Kananaskis and Jasper and Bang. But look at here, it grows like perfectly fine. Um, uh, balsam fir, this is a Christmas tree production in Wataska. I mean, grows, he grows probably 140 acres of the balsam fir and sell as a Christmas tree. It's, as I said, it's probably the most underutilized species. They have a nice and smooth needles and they like shade. They're slow growing, uh, but they can, like a Douglas fir can, uh, I measured personally one Douglas fir around the Cochrane area was a 347 years old, uh, really big tree and very old. So again, think about, uh, about planting the fern on your property. And then you have a cedars and juniper, uh, each of them are, there's a whole variety of the cedars and juniper that you can pick and choose. Uh, and uh, um, they do have a issue some with the cedar upper rust if you have a cotton. So it's not, never gonna, it's called uh, 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 cedar upper rust that is gonna kill your apples and hawthorns, but it's never gonna kill the cedar or, or juniper in that sense. So, um, but it's also very hard and very good uh, for the saltable and, and protection. Then you go in hardwood species, Aspen, poplar, and cottonwoods, it's been known, you know, to, uh, throughout Alberta, and you can plant them pretty much anywhere. Um, um, you do have an issue with suckering down the road if you cut them. Um, definitely black poplar and cottonwood love creeks and river and wet areas uh, versus aspen with a little bit uh, drier areas uh, they require to grow. Then you have a hybrids. Um, this is like I put a four, five, there is a probably other five, six that you can grow. Um, they have a for dry area, they are very fast growing, they have a different shape, um, they have extensive root system, um, they have a, you're gonna have an issue with the male or female uh, uh, on the, for the cottony seeds. So there is a choices there, but again, they'll definitely have a room uh, for the shelter books we've been uh, choosing some of those hybrid popular uh, species. Birch. Uh, today, actually, I got a clump, uh, again, the, oh, in, in the uh, sand pine lakes. Uh, he has 11 of them in the clump like this. And all of them, this is a five of a six of them. This, this fellow has 11 of them in one clump. It was just, I should have probably proposed a uh, photo of, of that one. And then you have an individual, um, very good, uh, birds are, uh, are very good species to grow. They like to have an area with a well drain. They don't, they don't like wet feet, but they also they don't like too much dry feet either. So every time when you have a little bit under the slope, that's the, probably the best way to grow the birch. Uh, again, there is a plenty of them, chickadee and Dakota pinnacle, I mean, uh, white and paper and, and all of that. Definitely one of the insects that is killing lots of birch in the cities and small towns. And it probably in your farm is called popular bower. Oh, sorry. Birch board, birch, uh, birch board, and uh, and uh, definitely killing the top. Uh, but then I'm I'm gonna talk about that on my on my past presentation. Maples, um, Manitoba maple is well known, can grow pretty much anywhere. Uh, you have Amor maple, flame Amor, silver maple, hot wings, crimson, and many others. They are the colors. One of the things with many of the maples, you're gonna have a, a diebacks. Okay. Uh, especially if you put a silver and some or other one, they really uh, don't shut down in the fall properly and the winter comes and kill the new growth. And you have to prune and new stuff come back, but they still survive, they still carry on. So it's just, they have a lot of diebacks, especially silver maple. Oh yeah, they are prophilic uh, seed producers, especially Manitoba maple, that produce lots of seeds. Ash tree. Again, green, black, fat more, foothills, uh, fall gold, black, uh, 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 black ash. Absolutely. One of the things with ash tree, they leaf out like a, maybe a week ago. They're the last one to leaf out. 
and they are the first one to leave fell, uh, fell off in the fall. So they leave out a week ago. By the third week in August, all of most of the ash tree doesn't have any leaves on the on themselves. So they have a relatively short short period for the with a leaf on them. Um, they definitely have a several several insects. Uh, I hope. I hope we never get a really bad one called ML dashboard, which is not here yet. Uh, but and if that's the case, all of the other ash tree will be wiped out. Um, what I've seen, what this insect does in Eastern Canada and United States is really devastating. All of the ash tree are down there. So you guys in the counties in Wispalt, if you are there or people close to the border or somewhere, don't move the ash tree for the firewood. If you notice a uh, green color, a uh, little insect, it's called Emil Dashboard, please let us know. We don't want this one in Alberta. And then you have uh, oaks and Ohio buckeyes. Um, there is uh, oaks, are they're slow growing, definitely, but they are doing very well. Uh, you have a pinnacle oak, you have a top gun, you have a northern pin, um, you have a bur oak, which is really doing very well. And then you have Ohio buckeye, which is pretty much I've seen almost in every part of the province. So uh, they have own beauties and, and definitely has a room uh, in your yard. Elms, well known. Uh, you have a three or four of them, American, Brandon, Siberian, or Chinese. Um, and uh, uh, they are very fast growing trees. They can handle lots of water. They have an extensive root system. And uh, uh, if you can plant them, I, I would strongly suggest you do so. Uh, we don't have a Dutch on disease. We always on look out for Dutch on disease. We got last year one in Ledbridge, but we caught on that. Um, beautiful tree, really beautiful tree. Uh, lindens, this is one of my favorite. Uh, this is truly one of the, my favorite tree. But I grew up, we have a tree that is 80 feet tall. We use, we put the bees and bees produce the wonderful honey uh, out of flowers from the, from the linden. And we also uh, made the tea out of flowers of the linden tree over there. Very hardy species, very few pests, uh, good shape, good color, uh, good food source for the birds because the, the, the stone stays during the winter time. Really, again, totally underutilized species, especially in uh, uh, rural Alberta. It's, you can guys grow this, this, uh, some of those species definitely anywhere, whatever you are pretty much. So they're, they're very, very resilient uh, tree species. Uh, willows, if you have uh, lots of water and, uh, uh, and the, in the lower area, uh, this is the one, this is a species you can plant. So again, there is a golden, lower leaf, sharp leaf, acute, and several others that you are able to plant. Again, um, they're growing fast. Uh, also, they have a relative speaking, uh, very few pests uh, that can go after them. And, um, and again, the, when you have a lot of water, this one is probably the best to plant. And then you have uh, all of the shrubs, all of the fruit trees. And uh, we are talking about dozens, dozens, probably hundreds of different shrubs, flowering shrubs, non-flowering shrubs, uh, all of the fruit trees. Again, you can pick the different colors of the flowers, different colors of the of the bark and the growth and everything else. I mean, I didn't want to go into the too much details on that. Again, um, sky is limit, really sky is limit to what, uh, what is available to us. Once you pick the tree species, you have to do the soil. Um, and you can do two ways, mechanical or chemical in nutshell, or not at all, which I don't suggest, but sometimes if you, if you don't do it, that's okay too. Um, chemicals. Uh, again, use the chemicals. So actually, this uh, on the upper corner left here, it was United States in North Dakota. I was there at a tour. They invited me as a speaker. And what they've done, they took a roundup, killed everything, and plant right away trees. Here's the trees that were they planted. Uh, this is my good friend in Barhead. Uh, for the tilling, he sprayed it, but also did the tilling. Again, you don't need to spray sometimes whole field. You just spray the way you're going to plant the trees and, and leave the grass between. And this is my friend Terry, uh, friend Terry, who 13 years ago, he did not have a single tree. Remember the folks I show you a picture of the guy in the, in the Penfold area, close to the Red River? That's him. He didn't have an, anything. And he built 
that little acreage over there. So it's a, it, he was everything small, uh, uh, small till uh, to plant all of those trees and shrubs. Uh, again, this is a Terry place that he started and what he built. Uh, spacing, it's recommended. And what you also see here, he did a different spacing, different shape, doesn't need to be in the straight line. Uh, be creative, just, just be creative. This is recommended. It's just recommendation. If you want a tighter, go with a tighter. If you want a wider, go with a bigger. It's just recommended. And you know your local, local area, you know your farm. And you say, hey, I want a tighter because wind is so strong. Or, you know what, it's not bad. I can go with wider or something like that. So, but doesn't also be, need to be in line. Like he put whatever shapes and uh, you can put versus just put the line of the trees. I always said nothing in nature is, is line. It's the only human made thing uh, that, is, that has a line on it. Once you finish that, you have to order trees. Uh, right now, what I got in, uh, from many counties and municipalities, I think all of the Alberta tree nurseries are run out of stock. And yesterday I called Saskatchewan uh, and they have uh, some on the Help International, um, but Alberta is sold out. Now, uh, in the July, they might have a this spruce pine and uh, stock. Uh, we call them a hot lift uh, for the small trees. You might get that. Now, the smaller the trees, this is a, uh, I can purchase probably for 30 cents. This is a uh, $420. This is 120 to 250. This is 50 cents. This is 60 cents. So depending on the size, what you want and what's your budget, you can plant the tree. There's a still lots of available of these. This one and the cuttings are sold out. Uh, we, this year, I think it was, a, I think it was gonna be a record year for the planting the trees, you know, right. But also again, this is on the right side. This is for my friends, Americans. They did a research and study, and they compared those the two. And this is where they come up with the idea. The big tree, uh, big tree become uh, uh, little, a uh, little tree became big. What they're finding out, the smaller trees you are, the more rapid and more faster develop of the roots it is. And that's what you want with the trees. You want the trees to develop the roots. I always say the roots of the trees is like an engineer of it. If you don't have a healthy roots, uh, all of the above ground is gonna suffer. If you have a healthy roots, they can take a lot of beating. The tree still is gonna keep growing. So as I said, having the root, healthy roots is extremely important. And again, what I learned from Americans, it was actually this like a couple of months ago webinar and I talked to the fellow in, uh, in uh, no, in, it wasn't Minnesota, it was in Ohio. And he, they did a study, American uh, federal government did a study and they said, okay, the smaller you plant, the faster development of the roots it is compared to the larger stock. And then once you buy the trees, don't kill your trees before they even come to the field. Lots of people buy the trees that forget about them. They keep them outside, full under the full sunlight. Uh, the small trees, are, are roots are dried out and you already kill them. Keep them in the, in the cold storage if you can. Cover them and you know uh, not to be exposed. Uh, spray with the moisture if it's necessary. Uh, so make sure that you don't kill them before you plant them. And actually, this has happened unfortunately more than than people want. Though, uh, people would like to admit. So they kill the trees before they even come to the field. So protect them uh, from the where you purchase to the field. And again, planting. Um, I always said plant, protect, uh, uh, plant on the cool area, on the cold, uh, cloudy days, the way it's really not too much sun, and, uh, and uh, ensure that site is okay to plant the trees. Uh, this is myself, um, a good friend of mine, Don Ruzica. Uh, what they, he did first, he put the plastic mulch, and then I was making the holes, and he was going after and plant the trees, and then we to us we rotate in that sense uh, again you can do the manual you can use the uh, you can use the tree planter now if you buy the trees that is in the pot or caliper trees as they're called this is the things that I showed the last night 
and it was a group of the ladies that said, oh my God, I, I'm 70 years old and all my life I plant the tree uh, not proper way. Uh, the golden rule is either it's a pot or the, or the burlap and bus, you always dig the hole that is two or three times width of the pot or, or the burlap and basket. Have this under the slope, the sides on the slope that you might have, okay? The, the second thing is extremely important. There's a, something we call the root collar or, or root flare. That's the way that where the tree trunk turn into the roots. And that we call root collar. That has to be in equal on the level of the where is your where is your soil or, or surrounding area. That's why I draw this blue line. That is your depth of the trees that you planted. One of the most common mistakes in the trees like this, people plant way too deep, way too deep. And then they have the pile of problems and many trees die. So again, I'm gonna show you next slides. Always don't plant it plant too deep, always big, uh, uh, plant big hole, uh, two or three times bigger hole, and always keep this under the slope, okay? This is where the, when you take this out, you want the roots going into this slope, and that's what you want. So here is what you have in the real life. Again, planting holes, two sides, size, has a little bit under the slope. Here is where the person showing the way is the root collar, this is where the root starts. That is where, where, the, where the trunk is. That's the level. That's, that's the blue line. This is the blue line that he is showing here. And then he looked the roots, take this out, uh, you know, clean up. Uh, the best thing we sometimes we do, you take this in the pot, put in a wheelbarrow and take every, uh, every uh, soil from there, soak them and take, the, take the, all, of the, all of the soil. Then you can put, again, you can see the slope, you can see the root collar here, and this is how much room, then you can uh, fill up with the soil. Now, lots of people ask me, Tosha, should I put a good soil in this hole? Okay, should I amend the soil? I said, no, don't. The only thing you might add is maybe up to 20% of the good soil, but mix up with the resident soil, mixed up very well, and then that's what you want. Because what happened if you put in this hole, all of the nice soil, roots of this tree will never leave that, uh, never leave that hole. Never gonna go here. Ain't gonna go there because it's tough soil for them. They're gonna stay here in this hole. You don't want that. You want the roots go into the native that soil. And the only way you do it, you put this soil back, this soil back, even though it looks clayish soil, you mix this soil, maybe out of 15 to 20% of the good soil, mix them up and put it back here. And then you do the back film. Last and not least, again, look at where he's showing the root color. He put the mulch, never ever put the mulch next to the tree trunk, never, always at least six inches further away. And then it, it's, I always said, you must put the mulch. Really, the mulch is the one that saves a lot of grief. Uh, for your trees. So this is again process, plant twice the size, make sure the root color is there, do the root inspection, take this apart. This is how it look like, add maybe 15% of the good soil, mix them up with the, with the soil that is, is you, you dug, dug, up, dug out, make sure you properly plant and put them out. That's the way you plant the tree or the caliper tree. And again, many common mistakes, uh, poor planting site, poor soil. Again, people choose the wrong tree species. Again, if I got the last night pine, that pine would never survive in the, that heavy clay soil. Planting too deep is extremely common. Uh, planting too shallow is also very common. Small planting hole. People literally take in the pot and they kind of draw the circle and that's how they put into that hole. That tree has a very tough time to, to survive. No mulching, no appropriate wa watering, and no monitoring. Lots of people plant the trees and then they forget them. And then they come back, well, my tree is dead. Well, nothing you can do about that uh, after. Um, weeds, uh, definitely you have to deal with weeds, probably three to five years. Um, this is always perfect. This is overkill. 
I always show this photo. I think that it's, this is in Cameroon or Vatascan area. It's uh, plastic mulches there, filling to the hills, spraying between. It's absolutely perfection of the weed control. In reality, most most of the shelter beds don't even come close like this. But again, you always show the weather is the good thing. And then you have a no weed control. Try to find the trees here is good luck. And again, the fellow planted the trees, totally forgot about them, did all of the farming, come back two months later and said, ah, uh, where my trees are. So uh, put all of the effort and now he has to literally look where the trees are in that sense and do the sun weed control. Uh, what kind of weed control you're gonna do it? A mechanical, be very careful. What, what's wrong with these pictures is those trees are too big. You don't, once they reach the certain heights, three to five feet or six feet, those tree doesn't need any more weed control, especially like at this one here, or like this hybrid poplar over there. This is, you are killing the roots of those trees. And that's why you have a here, they start disappearing because you are killing the roots. Once the reed, tree reach certain heights, leave them alone, let the mother nature take course and, and don't worry about, about the weeds because they will shade them, they will out compete them. And that's what you want. You want to have a, healthy, strong roots that is going to outcompete your weeds. Uh, chemicals, uh, I on your poll, what I've seen that is that most of you are farmers, so you know how to use the chemicals. So uh, be careful. Don't try to kill the trees with your chemicals for the, uh, for the weed control. Plastic mulch has been widely used. Uh, if you can afford a uh, bite, definitely help. Definitely uh, will reduce the weed control. And, um, and again, there is a, so many benefits. The negative parts can stay a long time on your property. It's a plastic. Uh, lots of people don't like it, uh, but it's, the, it's a wonderful one of the wonderful um, tools that you might uh, use uh, for the tree plant. Bush mat, uh, it's a, a foot by foot. You plant on the small tree. There is some, some of the mid, uh, mid of the hemp. You have a plastic one, you can remove them. Uh, sheep fescue grass is one of the options as well uh, for the weed control. Mulch and mulching uh, is really, really something. If you, if you spend the trees on like individual trees like this, uh, a mulch is one of the really, is a must. Mulch, actually the biggest thing of the mulch is not just the weed control and the moisture. The biggest thing actually, this mulch protect the roots in the cold, uh, weather doesn't let the air go into the roots and that's one of the things uh, i'm going to talk tonight is probably 95 percent of the so far problem with the trees i've received all across alberta is a winter kill and winter kill is radiation that hit the hit the spruce trees or pine trees and uh, what is the worst case is when that uh, cold go into the roots and the root, uh, uh, cold air go in the roots and the cold air try to take uh, moisture from the roots, from the uh, water in the roots and create the icicles in the roots. And that's the way you kill the tree. This mulch is definitely helping avoiding the uh, root damage. And that's why we put, never put like this for like a volcano, always like a donuts. I always use the Homer Simpson uh, phrase uh, uh, for the donuts. So, it's definitely something if you putting the trees on your yard and the, or the apples or cherries or whatever you have, uh, I strongly suggest you uh, folks use the, use the mulch. Again, you can use the wood chips with the straw. You can also use the straw, but watch out for the herbicide residues on the, on the, uh, in the straw. And the other thing with, uh, with uh, wood chips, don't use the fresh one. They will acid acidify your soil and they will, they will take away all of the nitrogen from the soil uh, if you put the fresh wood chips. Uh, watering. It is definitely, you have to do the watering as depending where you are, but before you do any watering, make sure that you check for the uh, sodium in your water. If you have a too much sodium, please don't water because otherwise you're gonna put so much sodium and it's gonna kill your trees. Um, what's the best way you do it? Again, you take a, a knife or screwdriver, put in the inside of the soil, uh, if you have a no, no soil on your screwdriver or knife, uh, it's time to do the watering. 
Again, mulches are probably the best way, best way. Um, slow and deep watering. And last and not least, water your trees in the fall. Doesn't matter how big they are, water them in the fall, week or two before the freezing uh, happen to your soil. That's, that will save you so much because what happened when you water in the fall, water goes deep inside of the roots and freeze. But water, uh, ice, it's a zero degree. It's an incredible insulator of the roots. It's when you don't water your trees and the air goes in your root system and the cold air is taking the water from the roots, that's how they kill the trees. So always water the trees in the fall. How much water? Um, again, I could not find any research in Canada. I, I have to go to Americans and they do have a research. Uh, once or twice a week after planting, water kind of daily basis, depending where you are, guys. Again, there's lots of ifs. Um, usually after 12 weeks, once a week. Okay. But again, that's a just rough. You know your area where you need to water. And if you are in southern Alberta, you might need more. If, you, if you're in northern Alberta, you might not need at all. So really, I cannot say that. But again, those are some of the rules. Uh, how much water. Don't fertilize, okay? Unless, unless uh, you have to. And why, what that means you have to, if you know that you have a deficiency in the soil, you do fertilize. The second time you only fertilize is when the old tree is under the stress from drought, from frost, from insects, from diseases, and you know they are under stress, you need to then a little bit give them a boost. Fertilizer is like a drug, and you don't want your tree to be addicted. Don't do that. Don't fertilize, really don't fertilize the trees unless you have to. If you need to fertilize with something called drip lines, as you can see here, and you always try to put this fertilizer spikes further away where the small little roots are, and they're on the surface, that's where you don't, Fertilize close to the trunk. It's just a waste, waste of money on that. But again, overall, don't fertilize unless you have to. And again, those are two things is no uh, soil has uh, no nutrients or deficiency in, in the soil. And the second time with the trees under the stress. Then you're going to have a lots of damage on your trees. Moose, limb, I mean, name it, uh, can go. So those are things you can't avoid, to be honest. So. Uh, try to protect. There is uh, some of the protection equipment, uh, you know, from dogs to the electrical fence, uh, to the tree guard, to all kind of things when you plant the trees. There is lots of lots of, of those things really helps to protect your trees. Um, um, but again, there's a cost cost associated to this. In nutshell, um, understand your local environmental condition. Uh, make sure that you do the proper plant and really make sure that diversify plant as many as much as as you can trees and shrubs on your property uh do the some site preparation uh do some weed control plan within a two or three years you have to do the some weed control plan water of course um and uh monitor 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 in that sense so um those are things that in a nutshell how to plant the trees now, Amy or whoever, uh, I'm gonna switch to the presentation. If people have a questions while I'm switching, uh, go ahead and start asking me. I will switch to my second presentation. Sure, Toso, uh, we've had a couple of questions come in actually. Uh, first ahead. one is, how do you protect against gophers? <laughs> uh... You, I think I have a way more experts in, the, in, in this virtual room than me. So I don't know if I call Amy or the lady from, from Vermilion, uh, Assistant Egg Fieldman on that. It's, it's a tough one. Um, the best way sometimes what you might do, if you have uh, old trees, all of, all of those are dead trees, that will invite a lot of raptors. And as actually the birds, might be able to control the population of the golfers um, to a certain extent, of course. Um, other than that, I really have 
almost impossible to protect. They will uh, they will dig up and they will go might go after the roots. Um, I don't know if Amy or anybody else can jump into this. How you guys deal with the golfer? I know you use the strict nine uh, to control the golfers, but uh, yeah, there's so a very few options. We do use strict nine or it is available for agricultural producers. Um, that's mostly on agricultural land. So if you have a residential landscape, unfortunately, it's probably not the best option. There are some other products available at places like UFA and PV Mart um, that you can get. A Rosal is one of them that is a little uh, less toxic than the strict strict nine because it is a poison. Uh, but Rosal also is a is a uh, something that you can use to take care of the gophers. Uh, one of the other questions that came in is, if we planted trees incorrectly last year, is it worth making the hole bigger now? Uh, yes. <laughs> Depending how big is tree, though. If you really have a, like, really, uh, there was a burlap and basket, like a big tree, or the, let's say six foot on the, on, the, on the basket, it's a tough to lift up and tough to pull everything else and start. If you have a smaller potted trees and you just planted like last year and so far I think we have at least in Edmonton we have a moisture. Yes, absolutely. Be careful. Don't I can guarantee what's gonna happen. If you dig up the tree, you're gonna see that roots of your trees never ever left that root ball that you that you got in a container. They did not go probably into the soil. Because most likely it's a tougher soil than the what was in into the in the pot. Uh, so if you know, if you did, yeah, uh, it's still not late. I would, I would strongly suggest you, yeah, do the proper plant. Uh, if you, if you just plant a very small, small hole. Yeah. That's all for now. Um, we have, how long is your next presentation, Toso? I can go quickly on the insects and disease. <laughs> we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. Oh, so. I have definitely, uh, I, Amy, I promise I will going to go through this. Perfect. It, I just want to make sure we are aware for everybody's yeah, time tonight. Yeah, so. absolutely. You don't need this. Uh, the only quick one, I do also provide a supply for the, if you have a problem with the mountain pine beetles and few things, for the, I provide a, uh, provided some of the pheromones and some of the traps and everything else. I, I, I distributed for one company in Quebec uh, for Western Canada. Okay, now with the pests, the biggest thing what always people said to me, Tosh, I have a problem with this. What can I spray with? How can I kill them? How can I get rid of them? Or etc. cetera. Uh, treatment without diagnosis is more practice, period. So uh, don't do anything until you really figure out what's the problem is. 99% uh, of the insects are beneficial and don't panic, okay? Again, diversity, you got that message. Protect your natural wetlands, protect your trees, protect your riparian area. They will do the amazing things for you in keeping all of those beneficial insects that is gonna go after the bad ones. Uh, as I said, 99% of the insects are extremely, extremely good insects. So if you spray with this, you're gonna kill the 99 of the good ones. Uh, this Dr. Carl Hafaker said, when you, when you kill the natural enemies of the past, you inherit their work. Up 100% correct, 100%. So what we do, we kind of screw up with the nature and then we pay through the nose, try to fix it with nature providers for free. That will apply same thing with the insects. Now, the bad one or the ugly one is a code. If I would, if I would uh, be face to face, I would ask you what are each of those and uh, this is a definition. This is what they are. We have a mountain pine beetle, we have a thistle, we have a milia rot, we have a salmonella, and unfortunately we have a COVID. So I move from insects to plants, to disease, to the bacteria, and uh, eventually to the viruses. Uh, those are very bad, very ugly. Um, and uh, uh, with come to the viruses and the bacteria folks, we know less, than 1% of them. We have a no idea about that. Truly no idea. Uh, one of the li oldest living organisms is of course viruses. Actually viruses are not living at all whatsoever. People don't realize that viruses are not living things. Viruses need the living things to live. Um, uh, they are very, uh, very hard to figure out. Uh, Bacteria, probably we have a three or four pounds of the bacteria just in our stomach. And if we don't have the bacteria, we wouldn't be functioning. 
So in all of the viruses and fungi and, and the uh, bacteria, 99% are very beneficial. With the fungi also, I wanna also mention that there is no blade of grass or plant in, on this earth that is in not some symbiotic relationship with the fungi. All around the world, doesn't matter what, what you have, grass or, or trees or shrubs or whatever, you have to find the fungi that is supporting those that want to grow. If you don't have that fungi, they wouldn't exist. So it, the, 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 the environment, natural environment is so complex and we know, to be honest, very little. Now, these things, you know, I got every day, I got the pictures like this. And I always said to the people, you have to distinguish what is the symptoms, what is the cause. And you can see the symptoms, brown, dead, raw, red, dead, scrubby, burn, okay, black look at things, something eaten, something happened. All of those are symptoms. And I always said, you must distinguish that. You must distinguish the symptoms. This is what's the cause. Winter burn. Chemical aerial spring wiped out this wonderful saltables. It was a lawsuit, probably a quarter million dollar on this one. Uh, leaf roller, no damage. Fungus cytospora killing some of the branches, salt. This is bacteria, this is fungus, porcupine, woodpecker. Those are causes. But when I get most of the time, it's symptoms. And that's what I do with my job is find out what is the cause. And once you find the cause, then you may or may not do anything about it. But don't jump into the treatment without knowing what's the cause. The second thing, what I also said uh, to everybody, People send me a photos of all the problems. I have to look everything around. I have to look how, where they are, where is water, where is it drainage, what is the operation? Is it city? Is it prepare? Is it is it is it field? Is it? I have to get all of those information. How much wildlife is it? If it's drought, if it's root damage, the age of the forest. I go to my head all to the pile of like a checklist to really define and say, yeah, this is most likely the cause. So. I need to know that. Lots of people send me just photo, like today I, I got a photo, one little branch. I have no idea how big is tree. I have no idea what is the tree. I don't even know what is the tree, matter of fact. Um, and they ask me what's the problem. I say, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it. I need to get more information before I leave, find out what's the cause. The next thing I look is the look, is it needles? Is it leaves? Is it trunk or the roots? Okay. Uh, and then before that, then I said, okay, it's a leaves. Okay, the next thing I look is the what kind of trees? Is it ash? Is it maple? Is it poplar? Is it spruce, pine? Whatever it is. Because insects are unique to the certain species. And that's what I need, what I need to know. Then I have a situation like this when I have lots of gulls. Like today, actually, I, I got, uh, it's not here, like similar of this one. And I got, I got the one. And I said, that's most likely what, it's just a gal. It's just cosmetics. Like this one here at the corner, it's like, it's kind of weird, but it's never, ever going to kill your tree. It will never, ever make any damage to your trees. But people don't like it. People are afraid. Um, and I understand that. But again, don't panic. Don't panic if you see something like this. Uh, spruce budworm. If you, anybody in you in this uh, webinar is from Southern Alberta around the Bragg Creek, they you guys have an outbreak of the spruce budworm. Okay. I was there, county hired me, uh, Rocky View County hired me to do the uh, survey. And right now around the Bragg Creek, toward to the uh, Cochrane and that little valley, they almost have a, for 10 years outbreak of the spruce bud. I haven't seen, I haven't heard any problems so far uh, from this one in any of the other parts of Alberta. The best thing is right now, they, you're gonna see the larvae going to in this, and this is a mature larvae. If you come right now, you might see the much more greenish color, but they have a black head. Um, and they have a crazy tendency, they just drop down when you when they feel that some somebody goes after them. Uh, hand pick on the small trees. And there is this magic uh, uh, biological insecticides called uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Kursaki, BTK, that you can buy in the store, in the home hardware pretty much. Uh, the, the, the mites, it's not, uh, it's definitely, you have a last year, especially last fall was very dry and you have a, might have a plenty of them, uh, hose them, 
take a lots of uh, high pressure and try to blast them out. Okay. Uh, there's lots of natural predators that you can go after them, but the best thing you can do is just high pressure water, put a little bit soap in the water and try to try to blast them off. If not, there is a some on this side that you can buy and try to control this one. Uh, spruce off light should start showing up right now. And they have a green color and they're very blended into the spruce trees. And again, the best thing you can do, you take a white sheet of paper, shake the branch, and you might find that this one or budworm as well. Uh, again, there's very little things you can do with this. Uh, again, you, if you if small trees, you might pick them and try to also, again, use the high pressure and try to knock them off. Um, and they can persist for years and definitely can kill the trees in, 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 if you have many of them. Uh, white pine weevil, like in last seven years, I think there's outbreak in central Alberta of this one. Uh, you can notice them, but like this shepherd, uh, 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 hook, and uh, you can see the holes inside. Um, they are flying right now. Literally, they are flying to the new new trees. The, the only thing you can do cut this off uh, when you don't see those holes, and take a side branches, uh, and they're gonna take over as a leader. As I said, they'll, this one is never gonna kill the trees, but it's constantly can damage the leader of the of the spruce trees. It's never gonna you're never gonna see this one on the pine, even though it's called white pine weevil. But it's in here in Alberta, it's only in the spruce. Gull again, cosmetics, really not much uh, not much to worry about it. People just don't like it. But well, I had in my tree that is thirty foot spruce tree uh, three years ago. I had uh, probably two thousand of these. Now none okay so it's just cosmetics mountain pine beetle is one of those uh, deadly insects it's ravaging our uh, pines in the jasper band uh on the private land we have in Vataska, and we have uh, in brazil we have a uh, ponoka uh, stratcona sturgeon uh and up north as well uh, is getting uh if you have a uh, this lady here is in torsby and totally infested by the mountain pine beetle. This lady has a uh, 350 pines around property acreages. Like a, they, they, she's in town. And uh, I uh, told, told her to buy the pouches. That's maybe it's worthwhile to buy this pouch. It's like a $10 pouch, that's the cost. And to protect some of those a pine tree, try to protect them from the mountain pine beetle because this pouch basically is distract them, is, uh, is let the pine beetle say, hey, I'm, I'm here, you can't come here. Uh, I already occupied this tree. Um, and again, I, I really worried about this particular case that she's gonna lose all of the pine trees and imagine, and, and there is nothing around the, her, ho her house except pine. So again, one of the messages, don't plant a single species, period. This one is a uh, pitch. Uh, pitch moth, that lots of people call me, it's totally different than, than, than Mount Pine Bill. Again, it's a pitch moth. Uh, I, lots of them um, really not significant damage. Defoliators, caterpillars, bruise spanwort, fall webboard, like caterpillar and bruise spanwort and tortix, they should have been done. Uh, you might not have them at all. Even canker worms should be done so far. Um, aspen leaf roller, again, will never ever kill your trees. Just, it can take whole tree like this roll and uh, nothing can do about this aspen leaf, leaf uh, roll, or leaf roller. With the caterpillar of spanwort or tortix, uh, definitely can use the BTK if you have a few trees and you can spray them. I think they should be done already. Impact of them uh, definitely reduce the growth. Most of those healthy young trees will uh, reflush leaves. Um, again, one of the reasons we don't have them most likely this year is a cold, cold spring, and they don't like that. And they most of the pests, most of the insects don't like the cold, and so that's why we don't have a lots of insects uh, per se. Uh, definitely can be nuisance, uh, and you know in public parks and and places. Uh, and again, you might use the you might use the BTK. Uh, this one is I got. Uh, if it's not a winter kill, so far I getting swamped by this one. Uh, and uh, aphids is all over. They come different shapes, size, colors. 
they extract a sticky honeydew. I find them pretty much in almost any species. They grow very rapidly. The best you can do, uh, this rain definitely will knock them off. If you have them more, take the hose and high pressure, try to blast them out. Uh, and again, if not, put the soap as well or buy in this excess soap and try to, uh, try to spray them. They are protected by the, by the ants. Uh, here's a little ant, like a guarding this little aphids because the aphids produce the mildew, which is sweet for the ant. And that's why they're protecting it. Again, it's uh, probably 30% of this year I got its issue with aphids. Um, Swedish poplar, um, again, you have a poplar borer, kill my tree. This is a picture of my tree. Uh, I have uh, like a 3000 holes. So when I cut this tree, this poplar borer all, well, to, all the way to the harwood. The danger of this one, if you have especially Swedish aspen, they can break off. And if you have around the parking lots or close to homes or close to the area, they can break off and really make a damage to the property or, or, or for the people. So, but not much, not much you can do about this one. I mentioned about bronze birch border, it's killing the tops. The best thing you can do is water your trees in the spring, water them in late fall. And if you already have it, you might fertilize yeah, and fertilize them now. Having the healthy roots is gonna reduce spread of this insect. And if the roots are not healthy, this one is gonna go from the top all the way and eventually it's gonna kill the tree. But well watering. Oyster shell scales on the whole range of the dogwoods and maples, cottonasters. Um, again, they, you should have sprayed them probably in April when their leaves are not out uh, with horticultural oil or neem oil. Uh, and now there's the other uh, also horticultural oil that you can, you can use it and try to spray them. If you have a, so many, like what is in these pictures, the best thing you can do, cut them all the way to the ground, uh, dis dispose the material and, uh, and new growth is gonna come back. This one, in, I got so many of them, it's called a needle cast. There is a four of them, three of them, uh, Rhizosphera and Stigmina on the spruce and Lophodermia on the pine. It's always killed the needles of the uh, year two, three, four, five, six of the age. And they have uh, this black, blackish color inside. O overall, it's never gonna kill the trees, but your trees, it looks like a hollow. This needles is gonna fall off and, uh, and you know, Spruce tree doesn't look like a compacted. It's lots of like a lots of holes, and uh, and again there is a, some chemicals. Effectiveness is questionable unless you have a really high value trees that you might spray it. Timing of the spraying, like this year, everything is late. Absolutely everything is late. So spray when to spray. It's again you you need to know about that. Um, yeah, you might have a, some fun, fungicides, but again very few very few products. Uh, the other one that is killing a lot is Cytospora. And again, you have a, like a whole branch, usually on the bottom end of the spruce, wiped out. Just black, whole branch. Difference between this one, it's a whole branch. This one doesn't kill the new growth. So look at the new growth here. This needle cast will never gonna go after the new growth. Cytospora take everything out. Uh, Cytospora also goes on the, on the cherries and goes on the poplar. If you see a branch like this, cut them off and dispose them as soon as you can. Leaf spot is also deadly. Uh, the only thing you might do with this one, uh, rake them in the fall and try to dispose them. Uh, it definitely can kill lots of, uh, lots of, of the poplars uh, if you plant it. Fire blight uh, is, this time of year is start showing up. Uh, probably when the day is getting warmer with lots of humidity, uh, this is a, a mountain ash. I was doing survey in the again town of Torsby, and it was a nice and healthy tree on August. No, Ju uh, July 15. I came August 1st. Fire blight came and wiped out the whole tree. Uh, this is also for apple pruning, but sterilize your. If you have a like here to do the pruning, do the pruning. Hold one branch, cut a, uh, cut a branch, sterilize your tree after every cut. In this particular case of the ash, whole tree has to go, go down. Black knot, I mentioned, there is everywhere. Uh, I said 
this one is never going to kill the tree. It takes a long time to kill the trees, but people don't like it. Do not prune now. Don't even think about it, because if you start pruning now, you're going to spread like crazy. So don't do pruning now. Prune in January, February, March, April, and that's the best time to prune. And again, if you do pruning, sterilize your tools. Uh, this one is uh, also uh, lots of disease, especially on the Swedish aspen. And again, this is fellow planted all of the Swedish aspen. This disease came, wiped them out, everything. He now totally didn't have any tree, spent probably $15,000 to plant by the caliper tree and have uh, some privacy. Um, you might, you might uh, rake the leaves. It's very, it's very, and burn them, uh, very deadly, uh, actual disease. But again, biggest thing, do not plant something like this. Don't plant the monoculture. With the disease, we have a lab, a provincial lab, which is really good. And they can find out if you have any problem with the disease. Now, all of that I said about insect disease is only 5 or 10% that kill the trees. Other 90% are this. Drought definitely weaken the trees uh, or kill. And uh, watering is definitely one of the options um, for some of the trees. If it's too old, definitely it's going to be the it's going to be the that it's going to kill the trees. But again, watering it's uh, watering is one one thing you can do. Frost, not much you can do. Uh, this one happened. A fortunate friend of mine he lost a 60 acres of the uh, hybrid poplar, and only one row that is resistant to the frost. Frost came on June 17 wiped out all of the 60 acres of the hybrid poplar and only one resistant left. It was heartbreaking, to be honest. Uh, salt. Salt is probably 60% of the trees killed by the salt. Very common in Alberta. As I said, along the highways, seven tons of salt a mile. Plus on the rural roads, they use for the dust control. It's absolutely long-term deadly killer. Uh, this is all of this is salt. This is in Edmonton. Uh, also, what they did, they planted a, if planting, this is in Edmonton, planting the wonderful tree cost me as a taxpayer around the $1,200 $1, per tree. They put the snow with a pile of salt on the year three. Many of those trees are already dying. Salt. This is my vehicle. This is how much salt <laughs> and on the snow and damage, physical damage plus salt. And this is the results of the salt, salt, salt. So if you want to plant the trees along the road and highways, stay away for the trees that are very sensitive to salt, especially spruce. There is, there is a, some of the trees that can, I show you guys that can handle the salt. Uh, herbicides. Um, I have a two cases that I have to defend uh, a person in the court. Uh, it was a chemical damage uh, sprayed. Uh, they try to blame the county, which is not the case. Uh, uh, there is a direct spraying, there is a drift and vapor and inversion, and there's a root absorption. In this particular case, all three of them. Uh, how does it look like? Uh, twisted, twisted after the spraying, like a shotgun. This is where I think, Amy, I, I might, this might come from you at this photo. Uh, 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 cupping. Uh, this is a sad case. Uh, it was an oil well from this side. I had a spillover, come to this area, wiped out all of these trees here. And uh, again, it was a settler in the court. Not uh, without court. They didn't go to court. The company paid for all of the losses in this case. So it's, it's very, be very careful. Be very careful. You guys producers use the chemicals uh, around the acreages or around your neighbor or property. They, people will take you to the court. And there is a more and more cases. Uh, that people go to the court and ask for compensation. Winter kill. Okay, 90% of this I got this year. Okay, uh, it's happened because of the radiation of the sun in the uh, December, January, February. It's the, not the heat, but it's radiation warm up all of those needles and the water start flowing. And then the cold in night comes and literally freeze, freeze the water inside, okay? Also in the fall, we have a last year, very dry, uh, dry fall uh, and people didn't water the trees. And then the cold came 
and furthermore actually absorb the moisture and that's what you have this. Um, uh, try to put a burlap or something, it's an absolute waste of money and time. It doesn't help. Radiation goes through this actually. And again, take the same thing and make a browning. This is a picture of this, what I took. And actually, whole of this uh, cedar, uh, were, Brandon cedar, were brown, like 100% brown. If you come to my place right now, it's 100% green. I took this photo yesterday. Half of this tree was brown, but you can see here small little buds start flushing out. That means a new growth is coming out. It's okay. If you come and see this branch and you don't see the new buds flushing out, a new growth, it means it's dead. So what you can do in this particular case, you might add a little bit of fertilizer, definitely add the water and the tree is gonna recover. This fellow add lots of water and all of the Brandon recover. But the biggest thing, water the trees in the fall and put the mulch and try to protect the roots. If you have a healthy roots, uh, you, they might be able to recover. Uh, other than that, nothing else you can do. And again, always look at, I've seen the 60 foot tall spruce tree, 100% red. And it was recovered because it's a bud were not killed and they flush out within a two years, that whole tree was green. But in some cases, the frost or winter kill is so bad that will kill your tree. No doubt about that. And I have a probably this year, 30% of the mortality of the trees, like no, no way, it's dead. If you, if you get one of these and they didn't have a, this flash new growth, if you don't see any green on this branch or this branch by July 1st, it's kaput, it's dead. Okay, so if you see some of the green, put the fertilizer spikes and water and trees should recover. Animals, I mentioned, it's a part of the nature. Uh, I always said live with that. Uh, yellow belly self sucker, uh, lots of people, what they told me, use the like old CDs or the tin foil, put on the trees, they can distract them or take a two by two by fours and smack and make a noise that they may scare them off but otherwise they are protected by the law. Angulates, again, very few things you can do. Walls, that's also very common. Uh, this fellow put uh, lots of wood chips right next to the, the trunk and this little wall was eating all the way. Eventually trees actually still, still recover or shrub actually still recover. This is also very common. You guys are cutting the lawns and cutting the tree roots and you're just invading, uh, inviting a fungi to come in the roots. Once the fungi is in the roots, your tree's lifespan is greatly shortened. So the best thing you can do, put a guard around the trees and raise your, raise your uh, uh, lawnmower. As I said, environmental is 90%. Chemical salt and winter kill is this year is probably 95%. Other 5% were insects and, and other problems. Um, as I said, with the salt, you, you know what you can plant. Test your water. Be extremely careful with the chemicals. And uh, with the winter kill, you just add a fertilizer and water and, and a hole. And put the, put the wood chips or mulch on the roots and try to protect. There's lots of books. I use this 3 every day. I also use this friend of mine, Doug McCauley, that many of you might know um, every day I use and I still learn every day. In a nutshell, don't panic. Monitor, 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 monitor. People call me when it's too late, okay? Uh, don't try to spray with anything, absolutely with anything, until you really know what's the cause. Once you know what's the cause, you can do maybe do something about it. Uh, most of the issues with mechanical and, and chemical is avoidable. So you can really avoid the problems. And there's lots of, lots of information that is available everywhere pretty much. And your, your folks in the counties and municipalities have a lot of information. This is me. I have a blog. You can subscribe on my blog. I try to keep every, every week one new blog. Uh, but if you have any questions, let me know.
Thank you, Toso. Mm. Thank you for that presentation. There's lots of information. I know I could listen to you talk for multiple <laughs> hours on this because you always have such good information to share. And I know I've used Toso before to send some photos and just say, hey, am I right? Is this what I think is going on? Or is this a bug I think it is? So um, you're right. There's lots of resources out there that are available. Um, Hannah is coming on right now. She is going to do our draw for the end of the night uh, door prize. So while Hannah's doing that, uh, she's put everybody's name in and is going to spin the wheel. Toso, there was one question that came in. Um, the question is, I live near old shelter belts that were planted back in the 1920s and 30s. They believe these shelter belts included Caragana and they've now taken over the coolies and have taken out the native choke cherry in Saskatoon. Can anything be done to restore native species? Uh, I unfortunately know. I've seen people use the Karagana, use the, all of the deadly chemicals to try to kill the Karagana. The problem is Karagana seed. Karagana, they're produced by the seeds and they're produced by the roots. And if, even if you dig up the roots, you still have a lot of seeds in the soil that come and do it. Um, the best way to control Karagana, which is in riparian area, almost impossible, is the tilling. If you do the custom tilling, eventually you're going to be able to get rid of them. Uh, and uh, and the flood. If you yeah, they don't like water, they don't like water at all. So if, if, the, if the area is flooded, they might reduce the Karagana. So what is the option? They try to on the spot, try to either either uh, take you know uh, uh, take the roots out or or cut them down or spray them, and then try to put the, some uh, uh, let's say uh, along the riparian, riparian area willow. Try, or, or even aspen or, or some of the probably balsam poplar willow and aspen to tr because they have a very strong roots and they will start fighting karagana as much as possible to be growth. If you have a natural cottonwood or willow or, uh, or balsam poplar, cut a live one and they will start producing the suckers. That suckers will start fighting with karagana and try to reduce the number of karagana. Once that kind of change natural vegetation might come back it's a tough one it's it, it saddens me i always said uh, that's where sometimes we have government way back uh supported the plant karagana everywhere karagana should have been only planted oyen in, in you know, desert like conditions never ever anywhere else but it's a very but again the mo only way it might again if you have a live tree cut the live willow cut the live uh, balsam poplar or aspen and they will start shooting suckers that suckers will create a shade and try to fight with the kargana otherwise it's it's tough perfect thanks toso yeah it is interesting to see when you have these um, invasive species on the landscape and then trying to get native species to come back in it's a bit trickier than we all thought it would be <laughs> so that's a good answer for sure um as you saw there was a poll up and a lot of you have completed it thanks again those polls just help us to uh, know how well the webinar went and also for planning for next time what we need to do um, so thank you for completing the poll. Hannah has the spinner going for our name draw. Hi, everyone. So this is a draw for a $50 uh, gift card to PV Mart. As uh, thank you for coming and joining us, and uh, we appreciate it. So I'm just going to click to spin here, and we'll see who is our lucky winner. Oh, I love this. Isn't it fun? It is. Well, here you go, Annette. This is so okay. Cool. So it looks like uh, Annette is our winner here. So congratulations, Annette. Um, if you could send me a private message on our chat here right away, so I can get your address, so we can send you that gift card. Thank you. Perfect. So we want to thank everyone for uh, participating tonight. Um, we will get you some information after the event as well, um, just letting you know uh, about upcoming events as well. And we want to just remind you again that we are having three more webinars. Uh, July 9th at, or July 16th and 23rd are going to be our dugout sessions. And we will also um, be having one at the last week uh, in June on a grazing management topic. So we'd love to see everyone back for all of those sessions as well. So with that, we'd like to thank
Toso again for presenting tonight and we will close the session so um, everyone can have a really great evening. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you for attending. Okay, bye.